All right, brethren, Isaiah 44, <clears throat> our subject is Christ, our sovereign Savior. Now, in that first hour, I tried to preach His Word. Everything in this book is His Word. And in that first hour, I tried to preach His Word to you. And I do pray He was the preacher preaching into the heart. But this text right here, from Isaiah 44, 24, all the way to Isaiah 45, 25, is the Lord Himself preaching. This is His Word. This is Him. This is His sermon. We talk about when He walked this earth, and we talk about His Sermon on the Mount. This is His sermon from the heavenly mount, before as yet He came into this earth, declaring what He would do. I don't know if I'm going to have time to read everything down to verse, verses 25, but I encourage you to go home and read this whole psalm, I mean this whole sermon, from Isaiah 44, 24 all the way to Isaiah 45, 25. This is one message from the Lord. It's too good, really, not to read it all, but I just can't preach it all in the time we have. Let's begin in verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. Now hear who is speaking. Hear who's speaking. This is the Lord Jehovah. And who is he? Thy Redeemer. <laughs> God who came down, took flesh, and redeemed his people. He that formed thee from the womb. He declares that he's sovereignly, powerfully working his will in all things. That's the message here. And he's doing it in all things. He says in creation, he said, I'm the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. He work in all things in providence, in unregenerate men as well as in his elect. He said, I am the Lord that frustrateth the tokens of the liars and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers. He's sovereign in the hearts of the wicked and he's sovereign in the hearts of the righteous. And he's sovereign in the salvation of his people. He said, I'm the Lord that saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah you shall be built. I will raise up the decayed places thereof, that saith to the deep, be dry, and I'll dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. You see, God sovereignly brings to pass everything. He sovereignly brought to pass everything in creation. He sovereignly brings to pass everything in providence, in the wicked, and in those he's made righteous. And he is sovereignly bringing to pass all things in the salvation of his people. I mean, not a, <laughs> there's not a second that anything is out of his power. Not a second. This prophecy of Cyrus, this man Cyrus, this was given by the Lord nearly, well, it was given 200 years, 200 years before this man Cyrus was born. Isaiah's delivering this 200 years before Cyrus was born. And God brought everything to pass that he declares here. Cyrus was a heathen king who never knew God. Cyrus was a Mede. He was of the nation, king of the Medes. His uncle was Darius. But the Lord anointed Cyrus to be his servant, to be, he said, to be my shepherd. Not savingly. As far as we know from history, the Lord didn't save this man. But he, he did it to use him to deliver the children of Israel out of Babylonian captivity to go back, bring them back to Jerusalem and rebuild, lay the foundation of the temple and rebuild the desolate places. And he did all of that to typify the Lord Jesus Christ who is our sovereign redeemer, God's anointed. Ain't that amazing? 
200 years before the Lord said, I'll do all this with this man Cyrus, then the Lord made him be born, and the Lord did it all to picture his son, the Lord Jesus. Drop down to Isaiah 45, 4. The Lord says of this man Cyrus, he says, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Cyrus's father was likely a shepherd. History says this, this man Cyrus, when he was a young man, young boy, was raised a shepherd boy. And, and we have a good indication his dad was a shepherd because that's probably why his father named him Cyrus, because Cyrus means shepherd. But unbeknown to his father, the real reason he named him Cyrus is because 200 years before, that's what God named him. <laughs> Because God said, he's my shepherd. I, even, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee. History says Cyrus read this prophecy. That's what the historians tell us. Cyrus read this. And he gave lip service to God. He said, he said he's the God of heaven. But he never knew God spiritually. God says here, I have even called thee by thy name, I've surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. History says Cyrus was a pagan idolater all the way to the end. He called God God, but just like he, at the end of his life, he offered sacrifices to Jupiter and to the sun and to all these other idols he had, and he thanked them for making him do all the things he did all his life. But everything God did with Cyrus, God did it for one reason. Just one reason. Verse 4, he said, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect. For my sinful people Jacob, and for Christ my son, my Israel, mine elect. That's why I did all this. Through Cyrus, though Cyrus didn't know it, God used him to glorify Christ his son in type, to show forth Christ who is the salvation of all his elect Jacobs, Jew and Gentile. Robert Hawker said, how often in the present hour are men made the unconscious ministers of God for good to his people, although their heart thought not so, neither did they intend it. You see, God said, I'm working in the wicked just like I'm working in my people. Sovereign. Sovereign. Now let's see a few ways that Cyrus is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, the Lord Jesus is God's anointed. He says here in verse 1, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed. Christ means anointed. That's what it means. The Lord anointed Cyrus to be his servant 200 years before it came to pass. No one knew who Cyrus was yet. Long before anybody knew the Lord Jesus. Long before anybody knew the Lord Jesus in eternity. God our Father anointed his son to be prophet, priest, and king. God anointed him to be the Christ, to be the Savior of his people. Psalm 45, 7. This is God the Father's word to his son in eternity. He said, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. He said in 80, Psalm 89, 20, David typified Christ. But God said this of, of Christ. This is who he said. He said this of his son. I have found David my servant. But he's speaking of Christ here. I found him, and with my holy oil I've anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. Also I'll make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. My covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed, that's you who are his elect, you and me who are his elect, his seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. That's Christ. That's Christ. What does this mean for his people? What does that mean for you and me who are his people? Turn over to Isaiah 61. I'll show you what it means for us. 
Since God anointed His Son to be the Christ, it means our Lord shall save all His people from our sins. That's what it means. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me. This is Christ speaking. He's anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison of them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. You know, when he calls us, he first begins to empty us, show us that all our pretended righteousness is just sin, show us all our pretended holiness is just vanity. And we become very much saddened by that, very angry by that. But our spirit, by the spirit of the Lord, he creates a new man in you. And he brings you to be saddened. He brings you to be saddened spiritually because you see your sins against him. But he gives you the oil of joy because he shows you what all he did, what he accomplished, that he's your righteousness and your holiness. And brethren, all our days as we go through this world, the trial is when our faith is proven. That's what the trial of your faith, that's the proving of your faith. It proves whether it's genuine or not. You know, Religious men are always quoting James and show me some good works to prove your faith is genuine. Listen, God's going to prove that. He's going to give you some trials that would make you so sad and so gloomy and make you pout and be so unhappy except for the fact that Christ keeps working this in his people through this gospel. He gives you the oil of joy for mourning and he makes you happy. He makes you rejoice in Him. He makes you to know everything's running right according to His purpose, and He's bringing it all to pass. That's the work that's going to manifest your faith is genuine. God's people will we'll get twisted by the trial, and we'll, we may pout and become upset and, and act like we never knew God for a little, for a little while, but eventually the Lord's going, he going to speak this word into the heart because God anointed him to be the prophet, and he's going to speak this word in our heart, and he's going to give us the, the garment of praise for heaviness, and we're going, to, we're going to glorify him and rejoice in him. And he just keeps doing this all our days. And those are the works that prove he really gave you faith. Man can't fake it. <laughs> God's going to work it. All right, secondly. Christ is the Redeemer who accomplished the redemption of all God's elect. Not only is He the anointed who God chose to be His Savior, His Christ, He's the one who came, the Redeemer who accomplished the redemption of all God's elect. He said, listen to me, I'm thy Redeemer. Look here in verse 1. He said, of this one He anointed, He said, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. Over 200 years later, God used Cyrus to subdue many enemy, enemy nations. He, he, he let Israel be taken captive into Babylon due to their sin. A picture of our fall, a picture of us being in captivity due to our sin. And then God sent forth his shepherd, this man Cyrus, and subdued all these enemy nations. God did it. Cyrus didn't do it. He, Cyrus was used, but God did it. God said of Christ, this is what he says of his Savior. He said, I'll be with him, my right hand will hold his, and I'll subdue nations before him. Christ trusts in the Father, and Christ is subduing nations. And then he said this, verse 1, And I'll loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I'll loose the loins of kings. I'll open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Well over 200 years later, after this prophecy, remember Belshazzar. That's Nebuchadnezzar's son. He's king of Babylon. He was holding the children of Israel cap captive in Babylon. And one night he took the vessels from the house of the Lord 
And he was in the midst of a drunken orgy, having a big party. That's what's going on in the devil's churches all over this world. That's what's going on in the hearts of unregenerate sinners. Religious men and women, including God's unregenerate elect people, using God's word to have a drunken orgy. That's how God sees it. God showed Belshazzar the writing on the wall. Remember that? Look over at Daniel 5. God showed him the writing on the wall. Daniel 5, verse 9. Then was King Belshazzar, when the Lord did this, it says in verse 6, I'm sorry, Daniel, verse 6, Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that, listen now, the joints of his loins were loosed, <laughs> and his knees smote one against another. Isn't that what God said would happen 200, over 200 years before? God used Daniel to come in there and preach to, to Belshazzar. Daniel come in there preaching the word of the Lord. He told him, he said, your father thought he was so proud and thought he had built his kingdom himself. And he said, and he said, and God made him like a beast and put him out in a field and humbled him down. And when he restored his right mind to him, God taught him that the most high God rules in the kingdom of heaven. God told him that he appointeth, he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And then Daniel interpreted that writing on the wall. Down in verse 26. Daniel 5, 26. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many means God hath numbered thy kingdom and he's finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians, given to Cyrus the Mede. Cyrus was king of the Medes. God made a noise outside the walls of Babylon, and God used Belshazzar. He got all scared because of this noise, and he told him, open the gates and go out there and see what the noise is. And so God opened the two-leaf gates, <laughs> and Belshazzar went in and conquered Babylon. Christ is God's king. Christ came down from a far country just like Cyrus did upon Babylon. And by his finished work on Calvary's cross, brethren, the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed his people from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. That's what's pictured in, in Cyrus delivering the children of Israel out of Babylonian captivity. The first way this work was accomplished is Christ came down and was made a curse in place of his people and he redeemed his people from the curse of the law. The devil had us in captivity using our sin to condemn us before God because we were totally guilty and Christ took all our sin away, put it away forever so that there is nothing with which anybody can charge God's people again before God. He justified all God's elect from all our sin. He made us the righteousness of God in Him. He made us perfect in His perfection. He crushed the devil's head on behalf of His people, just like Cyrus conquered Belshazzar. Now thirdly, there's another part of this work that had to be done by Christ. Christ is our shepherd. He's our shepherd. Christ is our shepherd who comes to each sheep that he redeemed and he brings us out. He calls us out and gives us faith to believe him. God said to Christ, verse 3, Isaiah 45, 3, he said, and I'll give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. That was God the Father's promise to his son. Our shepherd comes to his lost, unregenerate child who Christ has already justified from all our sins. And he comes to us through this gospel and we're in darkness. We're in darkness. 
Just like you could just picture the children of Israel in a dungeon in Babylon in darkness. And here comes Cyrus and opened the prison door and called them out. We were in darkness, but God's elect, Christ redeemed, those he paid this price for, they're his treasures hidden in the darkness. They're his treasures. I'll give you the treasures of darkness. They're his treasures. Every one of his people. We were hidden. We were bound in secret places. God said, I'll give you the hidden riches of secret places. We were the hidden riches that belonged to Christ. We were his portion, hidden in secret places. No man knew where we were. We didn't even know we were his. But God's elect are Christ's hidden riches in secret places. There he is, and he knows where they are. We were bound in captivity in Babylon by the devil and by our sin nature. We were captive behind the gates of brass and bars of iron. But Christ declared, remember when he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. They won't prevail against my church. They won't prevail against my gospel. Just like those children of Israel behind those gates in Babylon, those gates didn't prevail to keep Cyrus out of there. God opened those gates. And brethren, verse 1, he says, He'll open before him the two leaf gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Verse 2, Christ our shepherd will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. In mercy and in grace, Christ came to us. And he, he, he found us where we were in our secret hidden place. He found us. And there was no bars of the devil. There was no, no defenses the devil had around us that could keep the word of the gospel out of our heart. Christ penetrated our heart, brought the gospel to us, and made us hear what he had to say. And in mercy and grace and power, Christ loosed our loins in regeneration. That's what he did. He made us hear the law, and he made us know our sins it's the only thing that will humble a man. You know what will you know keep us from being offended at the gospel? You know what will keep us from being offended at one another? No, there's only one thing. Christ making you know you are the sinner. That's it. Because that humbles you down to where you, you, you think, I don't have a reason to be offended at anybody. I'm getting what I deserve. But verse 26, Isaiah 44, 26, God said, He confirmeth the word of His servant and performeth the counsel of His messengers. He says to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited to the cities of Judah. You shall be built. I'll raise up the decayed places thereof. And Christ works all of God's pleasure. He works it all. When Christ confirms the gospel of His messenger in our hearts, He looses our loins. He humbles us down. He makes us fearful of God, afraid, because he makes you see your sin, but then he makes you know him. He makes you know him. And he gives us his unsearchable riches. You see, we're his portion, we're his riches, and he's our riches. And he gives us his riches, the riches hidden from us by nature, the riches that were in secret places, hidden in Christ Jesus that we didn't even know about. He gives us his riches. The riches that he gives us is Christ, our wisdom. Think of the riches of the Lord coming to you, blind, spiritually dead, unable to hear the gospel, unable to believe the gospel, unable to do anything but what your sin nature dictated for you to do. And, and all the while thinking we were righteous, thinking we were holy, thinking we were godly, thinking God was pleased with us. And didn't even know him. And think of the riches of God coming and making you, giving you the mind of Christ, making Christ your wisdom, and making you know him. Talk about riches. Remember, it's a hidden rich. Remember Christ said, Father, I thank you. You've hidden these things from the wise and prudent, but you've revealed them to babes. He makes us a babe. He brings us down. The riches that he gives us is Christ our righteousness. 
He makes us see we didn't have a righteousness. We didn't have anything we could trust in. We had no way of standing before God. Guilty. And he makes you see, I'm your righteousness. I fulfilled the law for you. I did everything the law demands of you. I did it. I gave it perfect obedience, and God is well pleased with me, and in me, God's well pleased with you. That's what he reveals to you. And he reveals to you, and I'll, I'll, God will never be anything but pleased with you. It's an eternal righteousness. It's a perfect righteousness, unchanging. That's riches. The riches he gives us, brethren, is when he enters into the heart, there is a new creation created in the image of Christ and continually renewed in knowledge after the image of Christ that created it. And he makes you know now in this new holy man. I saw this yesterday. I was preaching the preacher school and I was preaching yesterday morning and last night to the church over there. And I saw something I'd never really thought about. When the Lord said, it's not Jew or Gentile, that, that in the new man, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. That's race. The Jews, Jewish race and the Gentile race. That's race. But in this new creation, you know what God calls us in the new man? He calls you a holy generation. You know what that word means in Scripture? A race, a holy race. Your flesh had nothing to do with it. Your flesh had nothing to do with creating it. Nothing in this world contributed to creating this. Christ created it and has created the new man in his image. That's Here's what I saw. That's why Christ said, they are not of the world even as I'm not of the world. <laughs> nothing of this world had anything to do with making us holy. Christ did it all. That's riches. And he makes you know He's your redemption. He sets you free. When you get this news, you can't be in bondage anymore. <laughs> but the changes fall off. You, you can't, bond, bonds can't hold you anymore. You see, I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. I've been redeemed from my sin nature. I'm free. Do you reckon, do you reckon that God's true people in bondage in Babylon who were just saw what awful shape they were in and wanted so badly to go back to Jerusalem. Do you think they had to be begged to come out of Babylon when Cyrus came in there and set them free? I tell you what, here's the sad thing. There were some in Israel who weren't God's elect, who God didn't, hadn't quickened in their heart. And you know what they did? They said, we like it here in Babylon. We'll just stay. And they didn't go back to Jerusalem. But when he comes and makes you know what all he's done for you and said, he sets you free and you don't have to be talked into following him. And that's so all our days, brother. We, could, we come into captivity. Paul said, my old man brings me into captivity and there you are in captivity. But God's working that. And the sins are all your fault my fault. But God is overruling that just like he overruled our fall in Adam. Why is he doing that? He's doing it so we don't ever trust ourselves again. He makes you to know who shall deliver me from the bondage of this, from this body of death. And he makes you know it's only Christ, who your Redeemer. And so you thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord that he's the one that redeemed you. Verse 3, this is why he does it all. That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. <laughs> That's why he does it. Has he made you know the writing on the wall? That you're weighed in the balance and found wanting. That, that you've been dethroned and your kingdom belongs to another. What you thought was your kingdom, Christ's been the king all along. <laughs> and he's now your king. Has he done that for you? I tell you, from the day he gives us faith to believe on him and follow him, Christ is our shepherd. From that day on, he, we know it. We believe it. And he keeps us knowing it and believing it. He said in verse 2, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. Christ our shepherd all our days. Christ makes us know he's the way. 
He's the way. Man, you know, oh, man, we get so complicated over things. Men with doctrine teaching different things. No man comes to the Father but by him. What's he teaching us in this life when we get off track and we're turned aside by the sin that so easily besets us? We, we, we're in our crooked ways. How, how's that way going to be made straight? God said, Hebrews 12, he said that he chastens us for our profit. Why? That we might be partakers of his holiness. What is that? That's all right. Let's say this right here is the way. Here's what it is. Here we are in our sin, and we all we think we're glorifying God, and we're going this way. Completely away from Christ. We've been turned aside by our sin, our wisdom, our righteousness, our holiness, thinking we're we're our redemption. And it's God giving us a trial and just putting a roadblock right in front of our way. And we try to go this way, he puts a roadblock right in front of that way. We try to go this way, he puts a thorn hedge in that way. You can't go that way. And he turns you back into Christ the way to see Christ is the way. And you know what he's done? He showed you he's your sanctifier and he's your sanctification. He's the one who keeps you in the way and he is the way. <laughs> the high way of holiness. That's Christ. That's the shepherd. That's the work of the shepherd. That's not my work and your work. We can't do that or else we'd glory. He gets glory for that. Pilate asked Christ, he said, what is truth? You ever have that happen? You speak of the truth and then somebody go, what is truth? You know what Pilate was insinuating by that? Christ was a liar. And that's generally what men are insinuating when they ask that question. You know what has, Christ has to do? When we're in our crooked way and we're, we're asking, well, what is, what is truth? Christ has to turn us again to him and make us to know all men are liars, including ourselves, and Christ is the truth. <laughs> he said, I'm the way, the life, and the truth. He's the truth. When we're seeking life by the works of our hands, crooked ways, can a believer do that? We do it all the time. Even if, even if it's just in temporal things and we work our job and we have some success of our job, what's the next thing you find us doing? Oh, look what I accomplished. He did it. Christ turns us back into him and makes us know, I'm the life. I'm your life. That's how he makes our crooked places straight. And he keeps being our shepherd from here on out. I can't preach the rest of what God says here, but I want to read this, a little bit of this with you. Here's how he makes the crooked places straight. He's continually renewing his child to know this. Here's what he makes you know. Verse 5, I am the Lord. <laughs> there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee though thou hast not known me. When you were dead in your sin, I came to you and girded you that, that they, all my people, may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. You want to know why, you want to know why that darkness came into your path? He said, I form the light and create darkness. You want to know why you were turned back to Christ the light? He said, I form the light. I make peace and create evil. Oh, you're, you're attributing to God evil. I'm not. That's God saying that. <laughs> that is him who is perfectly good saying, I create the evil. The evil is all of man. The evil is all our fault. The evil is men get want to blame God for the evil in the world. Evil only comes about by the hands of men. But here's what God means. If evil comes about, it's going to give glory to God and fulfill his purpose. And the rest of the evil that could come about, God restrains it and don't let it come about. 
You know what hell will be? Hell will be God taking that restraining hand off of men and letting them do whatever they want to do. Can you imagine? Wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's why hell, that's why hell, the lowest hell would be for, for the false preacher. You know why? Everybody he led to hell will be there just gnashing on it. Why didn't you tell me the truth? He's preaching serious business. God's going to hold us accountable. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heaven, from above. Let the skies pour down righteousness. They did over 2,000 years of that go when Christ Jesus our righteousness came down. They did when he sent the gospel to you and poured down righteousness and made you know he's your righteousness. They do every time he turns you back to him and makes you know he's your only righteousness. He pours down righteousness from the heavens. And everything he's doing in this world is righteous. All his judgments are right. When he afflicts us, he does it in judgment and faithfulness to keep us. And let the earth open. And he makes, you, <laughs> he makes you and me who are earthy. He opens us up and makes us receive the, the righteousness. Let him bring forth salvation. He, makes, he puts salvation in your heart and on your lips. And he makes you praise him for salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. He makes you to grow up <laughs> before him as one he is perfectly made righteous in him. And you trust him alone. And he says to you all your days, I, the Lord, created it. <laughs> I did it. I was going to read out and give you just, just some headers on the rest of that, but I just doubt I don't have time. But we'll look at the rest of it next time. You go home tonight and you read the rest of it. When we pout, when we're not content with God's providence, we begin to murmur and complain about God's providence. We strive with unregenerate men. He comes to you and says, Woe to him that striveth with his maker. We're going to question God. You just go on down through there and read it. And here's the main point of the whole thing, brethren. Our king's accomplished redemption. He's he called you that are his. He's calling each one using us to preach the gospel. He's leading us through this wilderness. He alone delivers his elect Israel from Babylonian captivity. And he's going to carry us all the way back to heavenly Jerusalem. <laughs> and we're living stones built on this one foundation. And he's the temple. And we're one in him. Just like the stones are one with the foundation. And this foundation, those tornadoes were awful bad, and they blew some houses right off their foundation. There ain't a storm ever going to blow this temple off its foundation, ever, because we're united, inseparable. He created that. He did that. It's all of the Lord. Amen. Brother Greg.